Hello, 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 and welcome to Property Game Changers Live. We have got a supersonic episode today. I am so excited because we have got Mr. Rob Smallbone, as you can see there, host of the utterly binge, binge listenable Property Nomads podcast. Um, so grab a cup of coffee and join us in conversation for the next little while. What we're doing with these property game changers is celebrating the power of ethical property investing to change lives. We're inspiring each other to believe bigger, to be bolder, and to be game changers. And today's property game changer, I need to consult my notes because there is so much on this list, is the author of Buy to Let, How to Get Started. He's the co-author of 101 Property Tips. He's co-founder of Devoy and Small Bone Properties. And he's co-host, as I mentioned, of the utterly binge listenable Property Nomads podcast. If you have any interest in property, you need to dive in. It's really fantastic. So just to give you a few highlights about Rob, Rob has raised over half a million pounds in joint venture finance, and, and he's a keen traveler and writer. He's been to over 45 countries, and he puts uh, Nicaragua at the number at number one. I really want to know why <laughs> Nicaragua is number one. And also, we'll be hearing more about how property has really helped uh, Rob um, indulge his passion for travel and really have the freedom in his life um, that mo many of us do want. He's an all-in Liverpool fan, which he personally called out, which he specifically called out, but I'm not holding that against him. Still going to chat on with, with Rob. And the other thing is, Rob is autistic, and we'll be talking about the challenges that he's faced in life and business because of that, and the secrets and the strategies that Rob has used to be successful. Rob's personal values really come through in everything that he does. Integrity, sorry, authenticity, integrity, and congruency. Bit of a mouthful, but they really come through in everything Rob does. And I'm sure we'll be talking more about that as we go through today. So, welcome, Rob, to the Property Game Changers Live. Oh, thanks, Stephanie. That's a hell of an introduction. And thanks for having me on board today. Yeah, it's it's brilliant to have you with us. So, Rob, let's kick this off by just starting in the middle and tell us about a moment when things got so bad that you just realised that something had to change. Uh, it's, a good, uh, it's a good place to start. Um, I think well, there's, I think that's twofold. Um, in terms of getting into property in the first place. My um, my business partner Aaron and I we were travelling in 2014 2015. We were lucky to you know we we sort of done it the traditional route. We'd been working, saved up the finance, and wanted a bit of a blowout sort of extended holiday. And we ended up going to Brazil for the World Cup in 2014, which was pretty cool. That's nearly six years ago. It's crazy. It was six years ago at the time. Wow. Uh, and from there we went around South America and Central America for about nine or ten months and. A lot of long bus journeys, a lot of talking, and, and we realised that although we enjoyed the travelling, and you know we up to that point enjoyed the working, we wanted to try and put, you know, put two and two together and make four. And you know, we, one thing led to another. We looked at different asset classes, different things that we could do. You know, could forex work? Could this work? Could that work? What about Bitcoin? Um, and then decided after studying a variety of wealthy people and families over the years that property. You know, that asset class would be number one. So when we came back, we we we, well, we just started uh, listening to podcasts, reading books, done a bit of training, uh, and then from there, you know, took the action. We had a slow start. I think we set up in twenty sixteen in January. We had a slow start. Only bought one property in the first eighteen months, I think, because of various you know personal reasons and so forth. Uh, but from there, we've gone strength to strength. So. You know, that, that would be that, really. I wouldn't say it was a, a really, really bad point. Uh, it was just a case of how can we make ourselves better to, to get what we want. And, you know, for Aaron and myself as individuals, you know, we're after very similar things. Uh, have the assets in, get the cash flow and utilise that for travel. 
Yeah. Well, uh, thanks for that opening, Rob. I That just sounds like an epic trip. Before I just carry on, I just want to give a shout out to Ornes, to Ahmed, to Emily, to Paul, and to Frederick, who's watching from Nairobi. So uh, enjoy uh, this conversation. And please do, if you have any questions, please ask. So, sorry. <coughs> so you were in Brazil to start off, off with. Is that right? Yeah, correct. We we gone to like I say we gone to the World Cup in 2014. Massive football fans. Uh, we're both Liverpool fans. So don't please don't hold that against us. <laughs> and we yeah we were there. It was a great experience. It was really really good fun. And and from there we sort of done a, a massive sort of a fish hook of, of South America. So we kind of went down into Argentina, across into Chile or Chile, and then straight up um, ended up in Panama for Christmas, and then made our way up to Cancun for February March time. Um, so yeah, we had a rough idea of where we wanted to go uh, and whatnot, but yeah, it all started in Rio de Janeiro, six weeks in Rio. It's fantastic. Uh, yeah, that, that does sound incredible. And it was that where you first had that seed that property could be the thing for you to give you that freedom to be able to keep traveling. And was it soon after that, that the Property Nomads podcast was born? Uh, no. So the Property Nomads podcast, um, I had the idea of the podcast, but I'll have to give a shout out to my ex-business partner, Max. He came up with the name, to mm. be honest. Um, Matt's no longer part of the company, unfortunately, uh, gone his own ways. But he actually came up with the name. So I'm not, I, I can't sit here and take credit for the name. He, yeah. he uh, said it would be, you know, because you like the traveling, because you were involved in property. He said that that's a great name for it. So I have to give him a shout out for that. Yeah. Uh, but that came along in November 2018. Um, yeah. And yeah, Devoy and Small Rent Properties, we started in 2016. So a, a bit of a difference there. Yeah. So you got started. Now, tell us a little bit about getting started, because a lot of people have the idea, maybe they're sitting on their holiday for two weeks or a, lo a lot of people seem to go away for a fortnight and they think, right, how could we do this a little bit more often? What could we do? And they have the idea, but they don't actually get started. So did you have some hesitations about getting started and how did you get over them? Yeah, there was definitely hesitations uh, about getting started. We I say we you know, read some books. Uh, you know, Rich Dad, Poor Dad is that seminal book everyone talks about, and it was no different for us, to be mm -hmm. fair. I uh, listened to some podcasts, done some, done a little bit of training, and it was on one of the training events afterwards. We we were doing some networking, some socialising, and I started speaking to a, a property sourcer who was based up in Hull. Uh, I'm from Reading originally, and. Yeah, we were just talking and uh, an opportunity came our way. Um, we put two and two together. The deal the deal worked. It, you know, I think a lot of people will say the first deal was probably not the best deal that you ever do, but yeah. it gets you started. And it was no different from us. Uh, the deal was there. We looked at the numbers. Um, yeah, we sort of went around asking for finance and, and luckily found an angel investor. And then that got the ball rolling. So to answer your question, it was it's okay to do all the theory. It's okay to listen to the book, uh, listen or read the books. It's okay to listen to the podcast. It's okay to do training. But at some point, to go from being a course junkie or a course addict or whatever, you've got to go and take action. And that action for us, following a buy-to-let strategy, it was it. It was, we, you know, let's raise the finance. Let's get this first one done. Let's get started. Let's document what we do. And let's try and make it better every single time. So it was just a case of we knew we had to take action. If we don't take the action, you're never going to get the results. Uh, kudos to you guys. And well, the other thing that often stops people is the finance. So you said you raised finance. So tell us a little bit about that, because at that point you hadn't done anything before. You are trying to raise finance. So how did that go and What for you? Yeah, so uh, we were lucky that we had a couple of people that were close to us that we knew had a little bit in the bank. So it was a case of sitting down with them, talking to them, chatting through, chatting through the plan. These are how the numbers are meant to work. You know, this is this is what should happen. Uh, and you get you get the same questions. You know, um, I think one of our investors asked, you know, what if what if the house gets burnt down? Yeah. Fair enough. It's a good enough question. We said, well, yeah, if the house gets burnt down, then, you know, you still got the land. There's some bricks on site. You know, it's, yeah. you know, th th this, someone told me a while ago, it's, if you invested money in property, it's pretty much impossible to turn that to zero. Yeah. It's pretty much <laughs> yeah. impossible because even the land is worth something, even, you know. Yeah. 
so it was just a case of chatting to people. You know, we knew we had a couple of people that had a bit of money in the bank, and it was a case of just chatting to them. You know, this is what we want to do. This is what we've got our hearts set on. This is what we've got. This is why we want to do it. You know, long term financial plan, all, all that sort of stuff. And you know, took a few meetings, a bit of back and forth, answering loads of questions. And you know, thankfully, uh, the investors had faith in us, and that was it. We'd done the paperwork, and the rest is history. That is such a good tip because basically what you're saying there is you're starting off with people who already who you already knew, so you already had that no like and trust factor. And then it was just the next step. And can I ask you, because since then you've raised over half a million pounds in private finance, that's excluding money that you may have raised, you know, from actual, you know, typical standard financing. And can I ask oh, what you were raising that very first time, how much you, money you were trying to raise? Yeah, of course, 50,000. Oh, right. okay. And I'm sure that at that time, uh, raising £50,000 seems such a steep hill, but now I'm guessing that just feels like uh, very small. Uh, yeah, kind of. I think it, it depends on your perception. Um, for Aaron and myself, Aaron's got a, a background in finance as, as well. Well, Aaron's got a background in finance. I haven't. At the end of the day, and it sounds flippant, they're just numbers. Mm. They're, they're just numbers. Mm. To, to Aaron and I, they're just numbers. You no, know, there's a deal. There's some numbers. Mm. This is what we need. This is how it works. But we mm. understand that for investors and people that have placed trust and faith in us, that for them, their background might be a bit different. For them, it could be their life savings. For them, it yeah. could be a lot more. So yeah. we have to treat every single penny as it is our own, treat it yeah. with the most respect as possible. Yeah. And we found by doing that, you know, we're, we're lucky that we built up that rapport, you know, with investors now, and they. The minute we try and give them money back, they keep giving it back to us, which is a good Fantastic. situation to be in. Fantastic. Um, that is brilliant because uh, money is, uh, is seen as a barrier or m many people think money is the barrier. Sometimes it's mindset that's the barrier. But so you've, got, you've gone from there in that very first property to now. Tell us a little bit about what your property um, investment looks like today. Yeah, so at the time of recording, we've got, I think, 10 or 11 properties, I think, at the moment. And we've got, um, I don't want to jinx it, but we're working on a few things where if they if they pull off, then we'll be able to double the portfolio quite quickly, wow. Wow. which, you know, puts us up a notch, which is good. So it's sort of between that rock and a hard place where, let's you know, say, got 10 or 11 properties, everything's doing OK. And now we're working on some things where we could, you know, almost double the portfolio overnight. So. That's where that's where we're at. Most of the portfolios are buy to lets. Most of them are, are in hull. I we'll make no, you know, no secret about that. We've got a couple elsewhere. Cause we've sort of created a sort of we created a triangle. So rather than put all the eggs in a basket in hull, we divided the portfolio out between three different places. So we'll keep simultaneously adding, and, and that's how it looks at the moment. So yeah, right as of. 1st of July, sorry to date stamp it, mm -hmm. I know. Uh, as of the 1st of July, that's where we're at. But, you know, by the end of July, uh, sorry, by the end of 2020, the, the situation could be uh, massively different. That's brilliant. That's very interesting. And can I ask, because this is something that I'm very interested in, are you thinking of buying multi-unit blocks or is it is it that you're doubling the portfolio by buying a portfolio of separate houses? Both. Both. So one is a uh, one is a portfolio uh, of of seven units. So that will actually we'll be taking it on an option. We wouldn't actually be buying that. So that'll be a long term option, lease option. Uh, and then the other one is yeah a, a block a block of flats because from you know Adam and I spoke about this for a while and you know listening to other people's podcasts and books and so forth. That if you're going to scale a buy to let business, the two ways to do it are to one of two things number one buy blocks of flats like you've just pointed out yeah. or number two commercial conversions or you know commercial to residential then you know then you're doing multiple blocks at once and, you know we decided to really focus on buying blocks of flats and you know go from there because it, it's economies of scale you know if you buy if you buy a house that's been divided into three flats for example you rather than dealing with well, if you're buying a house that's been divided into three flats, but it's on, on one freehold, so it's on one title, then when it comes around to getting a mortgage, you're looking at one mortgage, one broker fee, one solicitor fee. Whereas if they're all different, 
you're looking at free lots of broker fees, free valuation fees, free solicitors fees. So economies of scale, it's a no brainer. And again, that's from learning from other people saying, oh, this is how you can scale by to let. So that, that's where we're at. We're sort of at that, we're at that stage where we, um, you know, if we take, you know, if we, when we take these steps, as I said, at the end of the year, you know, the portfolio is going to be looking a little bit different, hopefully, all things being well, and that'll be a, a good position to be in. Great, great. Um, I really love the multi-unit block uh, strategy. Obviously, well, people may know that we're into HMOs, which is which is great. But we also, so we're buying HMOs, but we're also buying these multi-unit blocks, which we sort of stumbled into by accident. Especially the conversions we find to be particularly good in terms of the price um, at which you can um buy them uh the competition to purchase them especially if they've got a little bit of commercial the way that you can add value really simply by you know by adjusting the rents even um so so yeah there's a lot to that um Ornes is saying well done um and he's also saying buy to let and oh rent rent that must be towards me um, because that that's obviously not you. So Ones Ones is asking do do I like buy to let or rent to rent? I, I do both actually, and um, I prefer I like both. One is a cash flow strategy, which is essentially a business, which means you don't own the assets longer term, as so you don't get the end equity and the growth. Uh, and buy to let is an asset strategy, so really ideally you. You have the one that fits best with what your objectives are. Um, and for, for me, long term, it's buy to that. Yeah. So um, have you do you do any management or anything like that, Rob? No, we, we don't. We've what Aaron and I have decided, and again, this is down to knowing what you want when you get into property in the first place, where we're quite travel orientated. For us, it's yeah. we always look at things and say, how simple can we make our life? Yeah. And yeah, I know you can get systems and processes in place. I know you can get, it's all about having the right people in the right place. But having experienced rent to rent HMOs, and again, we've done it up in and around hole, hasn't really worked for us. And whether yeah. that's because we got the model wrong or things yeah. like that, it, it just didn't quite work. Yeah. So after that experience, we kind of reset ourselves, went back to plan A and went, well, okay, we've got a good power team. Uh, we've got people up here, great people up here. If we're going to add to the portfolio, but we're going to be traveling, for example, then we're going to need to, you know, have the solicitors in place, job done. Do we have lettings agents in place that we trust? Yes, we do. Do we have people that are better at people managing? I'm not a great people manager. So to have me try and manage a project is not my skill set at all. Um, so I've learned that over the last four years. So we need to get an agent or someone in to do that as well. So all of these things have helped to. Uh, refine our strategy and, and for us it is you know adding those blocks of flats adding buy to lets using property sources as well because we know if we've got the trust in the relationships we could be in i don't know turkmenistan for all i know but if something pops through we know how to analyze a deal and we can go from there Great, great. No, I, I think that's so important knowing where your goals are, what you want your lifestyle to be. And, you know, you, you have the funds as well to to invest. Um, so we've talked about uh, you getting started in property, you starting off with that first deal. And let's talk a little bit about the, the traveling you've done, because you've actually been to over 45 countries and you say that Nicaragua is your number one so I need to hear the story it sounds like there's a story there. <laughs> um, but no bizarrely bizarrely there's really not um, there's, there's nothing there's nothing special about but I say there's nothing special I'll give you the reason why it's number one I think it's all circumstantial um, you know if I was being if I was being socky and emotional then it would be Ecuador because that's where you know I met my you know future future Mrs. Property Nomads podcast. So if I was being sentimental, I'd say Ecuador for that reason. But Nicaragua, just in the circumstance at the time, you know, we were nearing the end of the trip. Uh, I think we were traveling with a couple of American guys at the time. Everyone was having a laugh. And, and Nicaragua, the people were really friendly. Everything was relatively inexpensive. The weather was good. The activities were really good. Uh, we've done volcano boarding we went to cigar factories you know we've done all of these sort of things and i think 
you know, we just want to look back on it. There's not a particular story, um, but in general, just for the whole experience, it was it, it, it was a country that had everything. Again, the people were nice, the food was great, the places we visited were cool. We done loads of different activities. We're hanging out with cool people at the time, and you know, all of those, you know, make it my favourite country I've ever been to. It sounds pretty damn cool, got to say. Now, Rob, I know that you're a podcast host, so your sound is normally spot on. Um, but there is a bit of interference. It sounds like something's touching the mic or bouncing the mic every so often. It just comes up. So can you just so, check that your mic is clear and not touching yeah, anything? Uh, maybe I'll it was it up the there. material or something. Okay. Maybe that's it. Sorry about yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's that, that's cool. So you, you've got. Let's talk about the book because what I didn't realize, and what I love to say, is that you can really change your life fundamentally within five years. You can change it quite a bit in a year, but in five years, it can be unrecognizable. So I was actually surprised to hear, Rob, that you started all this just six years ago, and the first eighteen months of that were kind of you know not actually much a lot of learning I'm, I'm sure but not not actually much in the way of property so you've actually changed your life you know drastically within five years and you've also written several books about it so let's talk about that um, t tell us about your books yeah absolutely thanks Stephanie so the from all the property training and everything that I've done or that Aaron and I have done we decided that I enjoy writing I, I really enjoy writing. I find that that and you know being on podcasts, being on great shows like you know Property Game Changers really helps as well. But I enjoy writing, and so to be able to, a lot of people in property is you know you know well you well know it, people can give back in numerous ways. That could be a lot of training, that could be mentoring, that could be you know all the things you see on social media, or you know look how good I'm doing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But for me, it's about the writing. If if I can write something that impacts someone somewhere. That to me is the most important thing. Uh, you know, writing for me gives me, you know, time to be able to think about things and then to work with myself and challenge myself mentally to, to get content out there. Um, but yeah, having done Buy to Let, we yeah, decided to, I decided to write Buy to Let How to Get Started. I just wanted to really show to people that if I could do it, you can. And, you know, so that was that book. That came out in 2019. Uh, that was a and we got that to uh, number one on Amazon, which was pretty wow. cool. That, that, yeah. that was a great effort. Uh, you know, that's a nice accolade to have. It's not, you know, it, it's just a nice accolade to have, to be honest. I'm proud of that. It's a nice accolade yeah. to have. But really, it's about who's buying it. Are they getting value from the book? Yes. And, and from there, from there, so that was that. That came out in 2019. I rewrote it for 2020 because of a lot of circumstances of change. So the book was already out of date. So I had to change a few things there. And from the network, from wondering how can you know we add to that base, I got the idea to do 101 top property tips, which yeah. that's out on the 15th of July, uh, 2020. And we've had over 50 people contribute to that book mm -hmm. to give their experiences about property. We've had people that have, you know, have done multi-million pounds worth of property, uh, various people, other podcast hosts, and everyone's put their own spin on it. Everyone's, you know, contributed magnificently. And the purpose of that, again, is it's a straightforward book. It's There's a lot of information in there. And for, you know, 10 or 11 pounds, for people that are looking to, even if you're experienced in property, but if you're looking to get started in property, it's very easy to get sold a lot of courses and then you become a course junkie. Now, I've got nothing against that. I've done courses. I love doing them. It's good fun. But if people are sort of teetering on the brink and they think, well, you know, oh, I've got a spare tenner, let's have a look at a book. You know, Pundra on top property tips is going to fill all of those needs. You're going to get a lot of content out of buying that. And yeah, I could I could route through the other three or four we've got in the pipeline, but one at a time. And this is what the focus is on is 101 top property tips. 101 top property tips yeah really looking forward to that um and also looking forward to contributing to it so um that that's great and uh thanks for that that opportunity and really looking forward to the book uh coming out um now tell us a little bit about what advice you would give to people who are just uh, you know maybe where you were just getting started about six years ago what advice would I give people? I believe in yourself. 
believe in yourself, know yourself as an individual. I think that's important, incredibly important. Take time to, if you're going to do it alone, that's fine. It is easier to do it with someone because you have that sort of approach where you can speak to each other. Mm. That's important. If you're going to team up with someone, again, take the time to know them, find out everything about them. That's really important. Uh, have, have the belief, have the faith. If you can do that and know why you're doing it, because as you know, Stephanie, there's so many different property strategies out there. There's so many different ways of participating in property. But yeah. if you know what you want, you know what your skill sets are, and you know what your strengths are, work, work with them, uh, and then the solution will come to you. And just have faith and always look to educate yourself where you can. Great, great. Sorry, I think that microphone's rubbing again. I can see your little collar thing. It could be my table as well. The, the table oh, I'm at is really dodgy. It uh, might be the chair that... as well. Ah, yeah, okay, okay. So, sorry, that's... people. That's, I'll, I'll improve my chair for next time. <laughs> <laughs> okay um and we talked earlier as well uh, uh property is a lot about people relationships and keeping lots of different balls in the air and sometimes having those difficult conversations and um you uh, mentioned that you're autistic and you've only found out this recently and just wanted to just talk about how has this impacted you and what strategies would you offer to, to people who may be in the same similar situation yeah, it's. I found out, you know, officially this year. I, I had had an inkling, to be fair, for a while. Um, it's only from ch you know chatting to my mum. My mum's probably the person that knows me best out of anyone, and you know she's been saying it for years. Um, um, yeah. So how, I mean, how did that all come about? That basically at the end of 2019, there was a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure from, uh, you know, all the businesses I was involved with. A lot of pe uh, pressure, personal life, that sort of stuff. And ended up, he ended up in late November having a mini breakdown. It wasn't it? You know, it wasn't pleasant when I think about it. Yeah. And I knew that, you know, well from there there was a lot of changes that happened. People left businesses. You know, we had to sort of rejig everything, and you know, all, all of that sort of stuff. But I knew that I had to do something about it. And and for me, I just had to face the fact that, you know, I needed to find out. You know, one hundred percent, was I on the spectrum? And yeah, I made a promise to myself that's, that that's what I would do. So that's exactly mm. what I did. Mm. Uh, I went out. We're lucky in Hull, actually, to have um, a place called St. Matthew's Hub, which is in the centre that mm. specialise in uh, autism and Asperger's. Mm. So we're very lucky to have that service here. I've got given the option of going onto the NHS waiting list for, you know, testing, and that's two-and-a-half-year wait. Wow. Or I could get it done in a, in a few weeks by having it private. So that was a no-brainer. I went to get it done private and yeah, the, uh, th that was it. You know, the, the speech and language therapist uh, came back and it was, she said, yep, definitely. She said, you wouldn't have known it. If people speak to me and I'm sure people are watching this, listening to this or that have listened to the Property Nomads podcast, you don't always recognize it straight away because what I've done through a lot of learning, a lot of education mm -hmm. as well, I always like to improve myself. Mm -hmm. So it's not obvious when you first meet me because I've, I don't try and cover it up on purpose, mm. but I have learned behaviours over time. Mm. Um, so that, but if you sit down for three or four hours with me, uh, as you know, the, the therapist said, is is obvious. It's so obvious, it's unbelievable. But that's because you, know, you take the time. Um, but in answer to your question, how's that impacted me? Well, yes, there was a lot of negative stuff. You know, November through to March wasn't a pleasant time. There was a lot of stuff to sort out. Like I said, people moving businesses, having to sort of close businesses down, join them together, all of this sort of stuff. So I took a bit of time off. And, you know, really a lot of it, you know, a lot of it's down to Aaron Eves. You know, he's always been very supportive. We've known each other 15 years, to be honest. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're very supportive um, of that. You know, we done what we needed to do. And then from there, it's been about getting back on my feet. Mm -hmm. um, how has it helped? It's difficult to look back now uh, to to say how has it helped. I think it's it's uh, it's helped me become a little bit more open. I think with people um, because ultimately the communication is important. You know, if Aaron knows everything inside out. You know, the missus knows everything inside out. The family knows everything inside out. And I think by having that to help them, it's not. It's this wasn't just about helping myself and feeding myself. That's, that's what it was about. Is how can I 
help other people and you know my immediate circle by having this then you know i think there's that increased level of understanding mm. and you know from there i've been able to again go back and you know what are my strengths working with myself doing a lot of writing um mm. analyzing i love numbers you know mm. these sort of things now i'm starting to develop the strengths now they're starting to come into fruition so mm. it's, it's, it's all one massive process so it's difficult to answer that question right here right now but i'm sure if we had this conversation in a year's time there'd mm. be a lot more clarity from my side yeah thanks rob i really want to um thanks for sharing that because i think we've all got those areas that of our lives where we feel oh i don't necessarily want to know this i certainly don't want to share this um i don't want to put it out there and have other people know but i think when we discussed earlier you were saying that actually you've you had such great feedback since you did, you know, share it publicly. And um, I just want to ask a, a question because I'm guessing that we're, we're all sort of on this spectrum somewhere. Um, there's, a, there's, there's what's called normal that, you know, is the middle, but then the rest of us are somewhere along the spectrum. So um, I'm guessing that as a result of the um, diagnosis, if you, if, if that's what it's called, um, that you have been given some strategies for being. And is there one that really stands out as something that you think, yes, this has really um, made a difference that maybe others of us could use wherever we are, uh, you know, on, on the spectrum? I think that comes down to knowing yourself. And, you know, the thing, and again, knowing myself, uh, I can get agitated quite quickly. Mm. Uh, so I know that if I get agitated or I'm struggling to understand something, mm. I need to be able to share that with the other person as effectively as possible. It doesn't always come out effectively, but yeah. you know, I yeah. try. Yeah. So I think for me, if I'm getting agitated about something, I've always learned that I need to take five, take five, 10 seconds, leave the room or whatever, breathe, go back and go, right. Okay. Let's work on this. And then for me, that's a mental reset that works brilliantly for me. Yeah. So that'd be the one thing. And have I had a chance to properly follow up yet? No, not really, because this is all you know, yeah. March. So again, with COVID lockdown, no one's working, et cetera, et cetera. It's been difficult to sit down and have further sessions. But, you know, there's Google. Um, you know, it's, and again, thinking about how I've reacted in the past to things, it's about learning as well. I love stoicism. Stoicism yeah. is really based around tranquility of the mind. Um, yeah. You know, we're, what do they say that any event in life is objective but how we react is subjective i.e we can always control how we react to something yeah so i think those lessons from you know marcus aurelius seneca um and others have really helped as well so again that's what works for me because that's i know myself i also know i'm a visual learner so if any agent or anyone ever sends maintenance reports i need to see a photo no two ways about it you know um, if they, if you know if this needs doing or a fence needs replacing, it's okay sending a quote. That's fine, but I need to see photo, and I yeah. I will communicate that with everyone. If you need me to do something, I, I'm a visual I'm a visual learner. So show me the show me the photo, show me whatever it needs to be done, and then I can work with that. So I think that's the other thing that's really helped. Yeah, no that that sounds um, that sounds really good. Um, I was just relating to what you said because actually we all have these challenges. Um, you know we may not be titled but for example you know I have a business partner so I'm in partnership with my sister and we're very 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 different indeed uh, she's very details oriented and likes to analyze everything if I ask her to make a decision on something she doesn't want to make a decision she wants to see all the possible options you know what's on the table what might be on the table what could be under the table what could be she doesn't want to make her decision until she's got everything in place whereas I'm very okay let's do this. And she says, well, what criteria are you basing that on? And um, so, so it's a great complementary partnership. But on the other hand, it can be irritating working with somebody who's operating <laughs> on such a different, um, uh, in such a different way. And so we've really learned, uh, so, you know, I've really learned to present things to her in a way that I know that's going to work with her that she's going to feel happy about and she's learned uh, or learning to do the same with me and um that's been a really I've really enjoyed that that 
that kind of kind of growth so it's been interesting to hear what you've been saying because I'm sure it's just as applicable um to all of us so so thanks for sharing that and let's move on to where are you hoping to go now your properties obviously had made a big difference you started just six years ago you built up what for that will be in the top few percentage points of uh, you know landlords in the UK for example most the most landlords in the UK the overwhelming majority only own one or two properties and so there'll be very few with 11 I'm not sure what the statistics will be and you're about to you're working on you have plans in the pipeline to at least double that in the coming in in the coming year so tell me where you're thinking of all this is heading for the future both in property and, and beyond for you well for myself for myself personally, it, well, you know, actually, for Aaron and myself, we're we're very travel orientated. So for us, it's really about you know looking after the assets because at the end of the day, you know, fully appreciate that people live there, people base their lives there. So we've got to provide as, as best quality as accommodation and houses as we can because ultimately, you know, people will turn them into their homes. So we so we've got a duty to everyone to do that. As a result of that uh, and the income that comes in for Aaron and myself, a lot of it is travel based. So it is, you know, again, we're massive football people. So it is about, you know, going to the major events, going to more World Cups, going to European Championships when they're running, uh, maybe go to a Rugby World Cup or, you know, some cricket or something like that, because that's our that's our sort of release. That's that's what we've worked up for. It, yes, ultimately, it, it you know, it's going to be a great pension pot, but, you know, we're 32 at the time of recording yeah. so you know 20 years time yeah you know it'd be slightly different it'd be a pension pot uh, for myself personally on an individual level as i said my fiance is mexican so the the aim is to move out there in 2022 oh wow so yeah to not well you know when you host the property nomads podcast you can't just spend the rest of your life in hull kind of defeats the object <laughs> so, I suppose that's true yeah yeah we've got, we've got to balance it out and yeah you know Again, what we've discovered from how we work and the people we've got in our in our team, again, if we're utilising sources to bring us buy to lets or blocks, etc., we know how to analyse. We've got brokers on standby. We've got letters agents in place that, you know, do a great job already. We can put the properties with them. You know, I think the yeah, the agents are great as well because they'll also, if we're not here in the area, they'll also go and have a look. There are eyes and ears for us as well. Mm -hmm. So again, once you've got all that in place, really. Yeah, apart from keeping on top of things, a couple of emails here and there, the only things that we really need to do, apart from connect with people, keep producing content, you know, for the podcast and so forth, is is signing the mortgage paperwork, which mm. is is not really that challenging because you know it just means the process is a bit longer, especially mm. if one of us isn't in the country or you know we might both be in Qatar for the World Cup in twenty twenty two, and if a deal mm. needs to be done, it's a case of sending paperwork. But yes, until land registry and solicitors accept e-signatures or stuff like that, which mm. may never happen. I don't know. So, mm. yeah, that, that's what that's what a portfolio will do. You know, we want to get to we want to get to fifty. Um, mm. For me and for Aaron, it's not about the number of properties you've got. It's never been about that because you could have we could have one property, but if that property mm. generates you ten thousand pound a month, mm. it's job done. So for us, it's not about the number. But, you know, we've both got our targets X amount per month. Mm -hmm. And you know, if we know we want to make 150, 200 pound per property, then, you know, that's why we've got a number to mm -hmm. aim for. But, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. But that's what we're aiming. That's what we're aiming towards, because, again, we've taken the time to sit down. We know each other inside out and we've got a common goal. And that's important. Yeah, and I think that um, that's really interesting because you've got the 150 to 200 per unit, and I think that will probably go up when you start buying the multi-unit blocks because um, that's something certainly that we have seen where we accidentally bought this 12-unit block, which works out to 32K per unit, which you wouldn't be able to buy yeah. something that brings in a rental of 450 to 600 um typically on a standalone house where, where we are. Um, even in Hull, I think you'd be hard pushed. So, <laughs> uh, 
Talk to me yeah. about Hull, because I I know that a lot of people, um, Hull, to my understanding, has been quite slow on picking up with the Article 4. Tell us a little bit about what the situation is now in Hull and um, whether it's a good place. Well, you're probably going to say no <laughs> to him there. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm, I'm not one of those people. I'm not one of those people that's going to joke and go, oh, there's no deals here. They're all mine. I'm, I'm not one of those people. Um, what's Hull like as a place? Uh, interesting. It's never dull in Hull, as they say. <laughs> I love that. It's never dull in Hull. Um, it's, a, it's a great place. Hull, Hull has got a lot of tradition. It's a really, really strong rental town. Mm. There's a lot of things going on. There's a lot more of industry coming into the area. I, I think that for, you know, for more old school people in Hull, the, the fishing industry and the collapse of that in the 70s or 80s, I believe, that had a massive impact economically on mm. the area. Same with Grimsby, which is just across the water as well. And then Hull's picked itself up slowly but surely, slowly but surely. Mm. It's, a, yeah, it's a great rental place. It really is. About a quarter of a million people live here. It's got decent transport connections to, say, London, Leeds, Scarborough, Sheffield, Doncaster, those sort of areas. There's a lot of industry coming in. There's a lot of offshore uh, sort of wind farms, uh, you know, Siemens. The biggest thing I think we've had in the last few years, apart from City of Culture in 2017, was Siemens, I think, spent about a billion pounds on a new wind turbine production plant. Mm -hmm. And that's been that's been critical for the area. So in terms of long term, in terms of long term, uh, what the government have got laid out for the area, what the local council have got in their mind with renewable energy and seeing how the world's going, that's a reason for coming up to Hull. And mm. oh, it's, in truth, definitely, it, it could have been anywhere. It could have been Grimsby. It could have been Scumford. It could have been Hull, Hartlepool, Middlesbrough, you name it. Yeah. Yeah. The general rule of thumb is if it's up north, it works. But again, yeah. do your own homework, do your due diligence, et cetera. So yeah. Hull in is a good fun place to be. Yeah, I think um, I, you know, we we are investing where we are, where we know the area really well, and where we can also manage it. Because what you've pointed out, we do have a management company, and um, for for HMOs, and knowing that we have that at the end of anything we buy, immediately adds value to it because we know that it's going to be managed to a high standard ongoing, and that's where many projects can fall down because I do hear of people, you know, buying HMOs in Hull from a distance and putting them out for management and the management doesn't work or the property wasn't quite the right property for an HMO or, you know, there are, there are all these um, horror stories and I think it all, it all operates to what is the exit and is that, is the, are the right people in place to manage that exit for you? Um, yeah and it's uh, you know if you touched on a few things there you talk about due diligence and knowing the area you know I think and I'm not just going to put this on COVID there's numerous things as well but Hull I'm just going to say this about Hull because it's the area that I know best I'm sure people listening to this that have got HMOs up and down the country might be able to resonate with this mm -hmm. but with all the changes in, in COVID and the way that the universities and people have reacted. They're doing more online stuff. It's just what we're doing now, for example. Mm -hmm. So it, stuff can be done from the comfort of your own home. And if you can attend a lecture, you know, and you're an international student, well, you could be in Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. and, and if the lecture's being performed live, happy days. Mm -hmm. So there, there is that. And you know, hey, I've been a student. You know, students are lazy. The closer to the university you can be, the better. Uh, a lot more universities are building purpose-built student blocks on on campus mm -hmm. so again if they're doing that and again students like being a bit lazy you know if they have to roll out of bed and walk two meters to get to the lecture theater they will mm. rather than walk 10-15 minutes down the road so I think those contributing factors mm. haven't helped hold to an extent because again there's a lot of landlords out there that have got a lot of empty rooms a lot of empty HMOs mm. because the university is doing a lot on campus Yes, COVID's hit as well, and that's not been that's not been great. Mm -hmm. but if you don't know what's going on in the area, this is the other thing. I I don't think you should buy if you don't know the area. Don't buy in the area. You've got to make the effort to at least go to the area, and you've got to unearth every nook and cranny that mm -hmm. you can. What's mm -hmm. going on with Article Four? What's going on in the student area? Mm -hmm. If it doesn't work, as you say, 
can we put it back to a buy to let if we do mm. that and there's article four how does that affect things mm. Mm. of course it's not just about students you know are there people working on dockyards are there people that are you know strawberry picking and working in the fields mm. so you've got to know this don't just get given something by an agent and go oh yeah great hmo and hull or millsborough whatever yeah 100 great management's 12 percent thank you everything's fine at the moment yeah people will look at the yields we've all done it we all look at the gross or the net and go oh oh that's better than the south yes i like this let's yeah. go and yeah. you know mr or mrs broker let's get sorted yeah. let's get started yeah and then they wonder why it goes Pete Tong, you know, what, what goes wrong? It's You've got to know the area inside out. So, yeah, I think Hull is no different from other areas. I would say, and I'm on the committee for the Hummer Landlords Association as well, and I, I would say my opinion is it's a bit too saturated, HMOs, yeah. at the moment. Yeah, I, I think um, Hull is is like a lot of other places, which is that if you've got something great, it's going to work because there are people who want to live in a house share in all of the areas. But what's happened is that a lot of the house shares that have been created are not a very nice standard. Maybe you've got four people sharing one bathroom, which is fine when you all know each other and your students in a very small house as well. That doesn't quite work as an HMO. So I think in those scenarios, you're not going to do well in, in that sort of marketplace. But I suppose some of the things that we've found since doing HMOs is it's it's like having any kind of business is if you can operate it to a high standard, you will always get a part of the market that's there. And if you're operating to a low standard, you know, for a not very much lower price, you're not going to see um, that market, you're not going to see that part of market. So, Rob, we've talked a lot about how this has impacted your life uh, as a, you know, in property and um, given you a lot more freedom, given you, you know, the foundations in only, you know, five years for a really fantastic um, business and also long term wealth creation. Maybe you'll have things in trust that you can pass down. Um, so, but also we talk about what the, the things that you're doing uh, to give back in the wider community, which I know that your books and your podcast is part of that. But is there any plans or vision that you have in, in that sense? Uh, to be honest with you, Stephanie, it's going back to talking about strengths. Uh, my strengths are trying to add value where I can through the podcast and through books. So really, that's that's going to be the case. You know, we do yeah. do we do have training. We do have mentoring. But we don't we're not we don't actively promote that you know we find that right we just don't actively promote it because we don't really want to you know put it this way the products are there and the services are there so if anyone ever asks the answer is always yes we'll work on it and then we're happy to add value and work one-on-one -on -one. but we don't want to be those super massive property trainers doing xyz that's just not us yeah but those products and services are there in terms of adding value, uh, yeah, it's you know we're improving, we're improving our social media just about daily. So you know, trying to build a, a big, bigger and better team around us, uh, and most of it is a book writing. You know, there is, as you mentioned, there's buy to let how to get started. That's on Amazon, uh, you know, Kindle as well. The same with 101 Top Property Tips. You know, that's out in July again. That's on Amazon. That's going to be on Kindle as well. And we've got three or four books after that that we're working on that again will get out there to the market you know the one that you'll contribute to will be the follow-up to 101 top property tips oh, so right. okay. Okay. Th there's a lot of that going on that's our way of adding value but we know we've got to get we've got to get better at the, the marketing and social media side because that's where the attraction is um, oh, so i would just say you know that's that's where we're at so yeah it, that's how we would like to add value back is yeah. you know at, at the moment we're very property intensive in terms of the content we produce in terms of everything we produce however moving forwards i think because of the way the name was set up the property nomads podcast i think you'll find that aaron and i will slowly change that into more of a, a business and lifestyle travel thing moving forwards but you know certainly at the moment you know we've got to keep going in property we've got to keep grafting keep working hard um but yeah adding value at the moment will be the podcast and it will be the books that we produce brilliant well rob it's been such a pleasure and a thrill to have you on and to really get to speak to you like this because uh, i i 
you know spent many hours listening to you and really enjoying your show and what you put out there and I'm really looking forward to the next evolution of the podcast you know especially as you begin to move and spend more time abroad yourself and you know eventually live abroad I think you said 2022 which is very exciting look forward to hearing the developments on the new way that you're going in your property business as well and uh, very excited for the launch of 101 property tips and I will be buying it and I, I will ask you for the link Rob as well so that we can pick it up um so that we can get hold of a copy ourselves and buy a copy once it goes live yeah absolutely Stephanie no problem at all I've got a little uh I've got the author's copy here so this Fantastic. is what it will look like so on Amazon I'll do it that way so that's what that will look like uh, yeah absolutely we'll provide a link to yourself and to every property game changer out there and then for buy to let how to get started that's what the cover looks like for that one I as love well. that I love that you so, like the black background obviously a bit mean and moody a bit moody <laughs> It's like the we're like the Rolls Royce of books, you know. We try and be as elegant as we can. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, we'll provide the links. As I say they're on Amazon at the moment, anyway. But yeah, we'll provide the links to yourselves. And again, very much look forward to having you contribute to, to the next one, which will be out in early twenty twenty one. Brilliant. Okay. Well, thanks, Rob, for joining us today. Thank you also for watching and listening. And we look forward to seeing you soon for another Property Game Changers. But for now, uh, bye from Rob. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. And bye from me. See you soon.